Okay, so good evening, everybody. And it's lovely to be here this evening um, to have Mark with us, uh, giving us this lecture this, this afternoon, this evening. Um, Mark is probably known to most of you, but I've also got a bit of background information here that perhaps you don't know. So Mark was born and brought up in a dairy farming community in South Cheshire. His mum, sorry, his dad was a vicar and his mum was an artist. He read anthropology and English at Durham University in the early 1980s and then had various short-term jobs, which included selling encyclopedias, being a farmhand, working in a chicken factory. And he was a barman for nine months in the East End of London and also spent three months with the South American Mission Society in Peru and Bolivia. His dad was a, his dad, a maths teacher and getting caught stealing when he was eight years old, as well as church army beach missions and a mission week in a Yorkshire mining town were formative in his calling to become a minister. He went to theological, theological college in Bristol where he met Mandy, who was training to be a deaconess. He got married to the then de deaconess of Chippenham at Holy Trinity in Buckfastley, which is the burnt out church at the top of the hill, and then lived off her for a year, which I think means that she lovingly supported him while he was training. Um, he served a curacy in Stockport, South Manchester, and spent 11 years in rural multi-parish ministry in South Cheshire and then in Somerset. He was the residential canon of Exeter Cathedral and um, the uh, diocesan missioner for Exeter Diocese from 2002. He was consecrated as Bishop of Shrewsbury on St Jude's Day in 2009 and it's interesting to note that St Jude is the patron saint of lost causes and he was in this role into 2018 when he and Mandy came to join the Ashburton and Moreland team. They have got two children, Francis and Sam, who are both now married, and they've got two recent grandchildren who are called Gabriel and Josiah. Mark is left-handed and enjoys fishing, um, and he's issued a warning saying that he once caught a 15 pound sea trout in 2016 and will tell anyone and everyone about it if they dare to ask. He also enjoys football and cricket, and there's a similar warning to bringing up the subject of cricket as there is to do with the sea trout. He loves the theatre, but hasn't been for ages and is also learning how to garden. So, some interesting bits of information there that we might not have known about Mark. Um, so just before Mark begins, I'm going to say um, a quick prayer for you, Mark, if that's okay, and for all of us here tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together tonight so that we can um, enjoy and explore more of what you have to teach us through Mark this evening. I pray that you bless Mark, that you bless what we hear this evening, and that we can all come away from this, Lord, having learned something new that we can take forwards with us into our differing church communities. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Heidi. Um, it may be you just want, rather than have to look at a gallery, you may just want to put it on speaker view. It's up to you how you do this. But thank you for joining us for this last in the autumn series on um, Jesus of Nazareth. Um, we wondered how it would, would take, but it's been good to have uh, the attendance week by week to learn together as disciples. And I'd like to pick up on something that we talked about last week, which was about... Um, evangelism and evangelists and people's reaction to the words mission and evangelism um it came up with heidi's talk about the church so part of my talk, look at that towards the end so an idea of where we might go this evening sort of four sections first of all looking at the missionary god and then secondly looking at the missionary savior the way jesus does mission uh, the full range of his mission thirdly then we will look at um, Jesus' way of evangelizing. And then fourthly, what lessons have we got for us? And I think this will spill over into um, our questions. So four seconds. And first of all, looking at uh, the missionary God. And I suppose a definition of mission. Um, 
mission is often misunderstood in the church as something we do on God's behalf. Um, it's a misunderstanding. It's a sort of, and I think it gives us this jaded view. It's a misunderstanding, a slightly patronizing Victorian era view. It's like we're taking the gospel to Africa, helping the ignorant become less ignorant. That's how people sometimes see mission. And it's a fallacy. Um, God's mission, uh, the missio dei in Latin, is the mission of God. So this is God's work. God's work in reconciling the whole creation to himself in which we're called to participate. So there's no patronizing in it. We're not doing it on behalf of God. We're doing it in the flow of God with his strength by his spirit. And we're called by him to help him in his work. It's his initiative, his responsibility. So what I want to say is the missionary God brings birth, bring to birth a missionary savior who then brings to birth a missionary church. And that's the sweep of the scriptures, really. A missionary God begets a missionary savior, which begets a missionary church. So first of all, the missionary God. In the beginning, you know, Genesis 3 and all that, we see how the world was made perfect, the world gets in a mess. It's the story of Adam and Eve. It's the story of the fall, everything going out of sync the story of rebellion and selfishness of humankind separated from God. Adam and Eve cast out of the Garden of Eden and humankind becomes lost. It's a biblical picture of the reality that things are out of kingdom. The world is in a mess and the creator is separated from his creatures, from humankind. And it's as though we're in the wilderness. And the rest of the Bible is about God coming, searching for his people, for his lost people, to rescue, to redeem and to restore us. And if you've got that in mind, that will give you an understanding of what's happening um, in the scriptures through all those complicated chapters and different sorts of writings. And Genesis 12 is a talk about Abraham. Abraham comes on the scene. God chooses a special person, a special family to be his family and he says to Abraham I will make you a great nation I will bless you so that you will be a blessing and this is a key part of Christian mission and understanding God blesses his people to be a blessing to others God blesses Abraham to bless the world to be a father of many nations and God chooses this special family the Jews to bear his light in the world. So he's the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, of Joseph, and of Moses. God commands, and he gives his commandments. And what he's doing when he's giving commandments, it's not all, thou shalt not, thou shalt not do this. It's more, behave like God, demonstrate his ways, embody and display them to the world. So the nation of Israel is to be a light to lighten the Gentiles, draw all people back to God by their presence, by their behavior, by their shining example. And that will be care of the orphan, care of the widow, the vulnerable, the poor. God's people are called to live authentically, to literally reflect the author of their faith. That's what it means. But ultimately, God's people fail to embody God's law and his ways. And on the way, you see how um, they put kings up, Saul and then King David is this a shepherd to lead the way. And then there's this Messiah figure that comes, the suffering servant in Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Uh, it takes this person who takes all the wrongdoing and this suffering servant um, is, a, is, a, is a reflection forward, I suppose, of the Messiah figure that God will bring. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering. He has borne our infirmities and carried us, wounded us for our, wounded for our transgressions. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. By his wounds, we are healed. 
So this is a picture of what is to come. And a missionary God, because the people couldn't quite live up to it, he said, I'll put a new heart within you. And he does a new thing. And a missionary God begets a missionary saviour. So we're looking tonight at Jesus, the missionary Jesus. And first of all, we recognise that he was born into an ordinary family, uh, the son of a carpenter, not wealthy. We know that because when his parents presented him in the temple, they could only offer a sacrifice of two doves, the offering of a poor person. Jesus is from Galilee up north, not fashionable Jerusalem. Nazareth, slightly on the edge, a small town up north. Think Huddersfield, Hartlepool, Barrow in Furness, somewhere like that. Not perhaps where you go for your holidays. But uh, this is God's way. The one who chose the shepherd king. And Matthew's gospel, um, you know, the genealogy, the very chapter one, full of all those names, the very start of it. It's, it's there to say that Jesus is through King David back to Abraham. He's in the line of David. And Mark's gospel is big on the suffering servant, how Jesus it talks about his sufferings and how he was crucified. They link back to this picture in the Old Testament. So if we look at Jesus' life and activity, we'll see mission is pluriform rather than singular in nature. And that's what I want us to look at now. Jesus' mission takes many forms. Now, I'm going to attempt to um, put up a PowerPoint. It might all go terribly wrong, but we'll see. OK. I hope that's is that working. Is it up? Yes. Brilliant. I hope you can see that. So the missionary Jesus. And there's that definition I talked about. God's work in reconciling the whole of himself in which we're called to participate. So if you look at Jesus's ministry, um, this is what the mission is like. First of all, it's individual. It's full of individual encounters. Jesus, uh, one to one. Uh, Nathaniel, Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman, the royal official, the invalid at the pool of Bethsartha, the woman caught in adultery, the man born blind. Jesus pays attention to the people who are in front of him. And it's they who spread his message wide. Uh, the New Test Testament seems to insist that religion is not this kind of public global thing, but rather something that's intimately to do with Jesus and you. Uh, conversation Jesus has with individuals are recorded. Mission's also national. Matthew's gospel, often known as the gospel for the Jews, Jesus sends out the disciples with a command to only go to the lost sheep of Israel. Mission starts at home. Mission is for the poor. Look at Jesus, blessed are the messages. He's always using um, stories about rich and the poor, um, the difficulties of a camel to get through the eye of a needle, the rich young ruler told to sell everything and give to the poor. Jesus's action tells us about time with the rural poor. It's about um, daily companions. He's not there with the wealthy, he's with the ordinary people. And it's as though God has a bias to the poor. It's international as well. Matthew's gospel actually has a much wider picture. If you think who comes to worship him, it's the wise men, the foreigners, um, while the Jews attempt to kill him. Indeed, this Jewish gospel ends with a call for the disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded them. So mission for Matthew is not just for the Jews, it's for everyone. It's a global concern. It's redemptive. 
mission makes a difference to people's lives. Um, Jesus said he came to give his life as a ransom for many. And John 3, chapter 16, it's about saving people's lives from judgment, restoring them into a relationship with God. It's also about liberation. Rede redemption isn't just about saving people's souls. It's much more than that. It's about release from for captives, release from bondage, be it financial, spiritual, moral, political, sexual or economic. Mission is about healing. Jesus, one of the things he does is heal people. It's a key aspect of his ministry. His healing miracles are different from those of other miracle workers of the time because Jesus tended to affect the miracle himself whereas other miracle workers would specifically pray for the miracle to take place. And when Jesus does heal people, there's a sense of wholeness rather than just a physical cure. They've been put right, perhaps with their community too. So it has a social effect. The woman who's healed with, from her bleeding with the hemorrhage, she can go back into society. She's no longer ashamed. The lepers who are healed, they too, can both go back and join the community and earn a living. Um, healing miracles and encounters lead to re-inclusion with society. That's what Jesus does, brings people together, liberates them from exclusion. It's political too. There's a lot of political action. Jesus talking about the kingdom of God, that's a direct threat to Caesar's kingdom where Caesar is the king and the Romans are in charge. The reign of God is both a future promise but also a present reality. Kingdom language and the talk of Jesus king is a direct challenge and of course in the end Jesus is killed as a political rebel. Jesus is killed as pretending to the throne the Romans, because he was tr saying he was Caesar, they thought, or the Jews, because he was claiming to be the Messiah. Missions also, if you look at Jesus and his ministry and activity, it's about socializing. Jesus was a party animal. He spends all the time eating and drinking. He's, he's with all the reprobates. And he's having a jolly good time. John the Baptist came and he hardly drank anything and, you know, certainly went off in the wilderness and, and fasted, Jesus got accused of being, you know, with the gluttons and the drunkards. But wherever he goes, he enjoys hospitality and he enjoys people's company. He could do um, well-being. In a sense, you know, I remember doing a mission in one of our churches in South Cheshire and someone came up and said, Mark, I can't do all this mission malarkey, but I can make meat and potato pie. And I said, well, yeah, you can do mission then. If you can do meat and potato pie or apple pie, you're in. That's the greatest mission tool ever. So table fellowship is the normative mission theme for Jesus. And it's about building community. Um, Jesus didn't leave a book or a building when he died, what he left was a group of people who believed in God and believed in him, a community of believers to carry on his work. And he builds around him um, many people. And it's like a rabbi's um, theme that he's doing, a rabbi to the other disciples. His mission is also about teaching uh, we know about the Beatitudes and he was always teaching and the note, the use of storytelling, very important for Jesus and the apostles teaching later. And it's also confrontational. Um, not just about building community, but it's about getting up people's noses, not just on purpose. He just does it by being himself. Um, and the cleansing of the temple is the ultimate confrontation. Um, I, I know I've said this before, but people think it's just about uh, he got angry because people were perhaps selling things in the temple. But what he was really angry about was the money changers were preventing people getting access to God. 
And you have to realize there's a massive income bringer was the temple, people bringing sacrifices, and they had to pay uh, to sacrifice their animals. So when Jesus stopped the temple sacrifices, he was like stopping the stock exchange. He was really helping the conqueror halt. No wonder everyone was out for his throat at the end of that. So mission is many, many things. If you look at Jesus's uh, mission, it's many things. But perhaps we can sum it up particularly in him as being a person who was prayerful and obedient, even obedient unto death. He had a simple lifestyle. He was with the ordinary people. He showed compassion to the poor. And he came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So these are perhaps marks of his character, who he was. And out of who he was, his mission came. So mission is, in a sense, reflecting the heart of God. Um, Matthew's Gospel in particular, it says that Jesus is Emmanuel, God is with us. Not God seems to be with you, not just apparently, but he is with you. And everyone should be able to say that God is really with people like us. And each um, scripture um, each gospel has a sending text. Matthew's gospel, go make disciples of all nations. But in John's gospel, um, particularly different. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Jesus comes in the flesh, weak, alongside us. And as the Father sent me, so I send you. There's a direct challenge to his disciples as to how we go about our mission and God's mission. And two examples of listening um, evangelism. So we're coming on to the third section now about Jesus as an evangelist. And one of them you should know, I'm sure you will know very well, Jesus on the road to Emmaus. Luke chapter 24 you might look it up later uh, where we see how he listened to the disciples he asked them questions before he explained the scriptures there's also actually Paul at the Areopagus in in Athens is also a good example of listening evangelism Acts chapter 17 but we'll look particularly I think at Jesus on the Emmaus road because I think he has things to teach us about um, mission and evangelism through this um, really quite detailed incident. So you remember that Jesus, there's two companions, it's, he's died the day after his crucifixion and the, the disciples, two disciples are leaving Jerusalem, going away from Jerusalem towards the village of Emmaus or on the road and they're talking to each other. And as they're talking, they're arguing, and Jesus comes alongside them. And um, he chats with them and asks them what they're talking about. And they're sort of amazed. Don't you know what's going on in Jerusalem? Don't you know what's happened these past few days? And they tell a story about the Messiah, Jesus, who Christ talk about Jesus himself, but they don't recognize Jesus. But Jesus is there. How does he do? He goes out with the people is where people are with all their their hue and their cry and their anxiety he's with them he goes along with these disciples walks with them even though they're actually going in the wrong direction he should have stayed in jerusalem but he's going along with them walking with them something about that walking with people in the wrong direction that might be part of evangelism he listens first he doesn't give them the big speech he just listens to what they're saying and then he asks some probing questions. What is it you're talking about? What's the news you've heard? And they're amazed. And he almost lets himself be vulnerable. 
you know, it's, how stupid, yeah, well, you know, don't you know what's going on? And they let, he lets them tell him. And only then, he doesn't give up on them, he walks with them, he spends time with them. He doesn't actually push them for a decision, but he does unfold after he's asked the questions, but he lets them discover for themselves. And they only recognize him when he stops to have a meal with them, um, a Demaeus and breaks the bread. And that's when they recognize him. So he's discovered in the power of scripture and sacrament. Maybe that's a way we can learn about evangelism, the way Jesus did. So I just want to come on briefly before we finish about um, this word evangelism. Last week it evoked a lot of um, well, strong feeling really about, oh, evangelism, you know, it's, it's almost like a dirty word, but actually it's, it's a good word. It's just that somehow it's lost its meaning for us. It's something that we, we don't really like. Evangelism is the way by which people become followers of Jesus Christ. The word from the Greek, evangelion, is where we get the word for angel. The word angel is in the middle of evangelism. And we know that angels are messengers sent by God with good news. So evangelism is actually good news we have to ask ourselves, why has it become such bad news for us? What's the difficulty? There's lots of definitions of evangelism. Here are two I really like. Um, D.T. Niles, one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. I like that because it's not you. You're not superior over anybody. You're you're a beggar. You found something to to keep you alive, and you're telling others about it. And the same with this other anonymous quotation which i really like there is a crime in the desert worse than murder knowing where to find water but telling no one about it we are fortunate people who have discovered good news we discovered living water in the middle of a desert how can we keep such knowledge to ourselves it's not sharing out of superiority, it's sharing out of weakness and out of joy and surprise. Um, I, a few years ago, just as I, when I was Bishop of Shrewsbury, I was given a, a doctorate from the University of Shrewsbury, um, which I was a bit embarrassed about, but I, was, uh, um, I, I said yes. Um, but I, I, I at the... Um, at the service when I accepted it and um, had to give a speech, I said the PhD, getting this PhD or receiving this honorary doctorate is like God's grace. I haven't earned it. I don't deserve it, but I'm jolly glad to have it. And that seems to me what evangelism is about. You know, we haven't earned it. God's place and, and God's love, we, we don't deserve it, but we're really glad to have it. So let's tell others about it. And then what can we learn from Jesus' way? I think these are the lessons just before we go into our discussion groups. Um, why is it that evangelism has become so difficult or mission seems hard? And I think it's something to do with us as a church back in the 70s 60s people used to say you want people come to belief first in the christian faith and then they belong join the church and then we behave like christians that how is how people came to faith 80s and 90s there was much more emphasis on people belonging first come and be part of the christian community and then you'll believe and then yes then we'll be followers and love god love our neighbors behave but now it seems to me that evangelism best done today is by the Christian church behaving, if you like, so people can see us um, at work, loving God, loving our neighbor, loving people on the outside, um, serving others. And when people see that behavior, they then belong and want to be part of that, something that's good, 
and maybe only then will they become to believe. When I was um, running night church at Exeter Cathedral back in 2006 and 7, um, we had a lot of people join because they liked what the cathedral was doing Friday night, meeting those who are homeless, those who are students and people who are out for the evening, the nighttime economy, just trying to be alongside people. They came to join us, uh, but they liked what was happening and then they joined and then they came to be disciples. It was that way around. And maybe that's what we have to do in the 21st century when people are more aware the church is an abusing organization that we terrible things have been done in the name of the church how can people trust the church so we have to regain trust uh, we have to live authentically smell and feel like the kingdom of god and maybe then people will believe our words but evangelism is good news uh, but somehow we maybe we have to regain trust So I'm going to try and just come back now. Um, so I think I just want to leave it there, perhaps with some questions to take into the small groups about, you know, what can we learn here from Jesus' mission? So wide ranging, it's about, it's almost everything. And maybe what do you feel about evangelism and, and how can we reclaim this word as honorable work for us as Christians? um so living authentically and therefore being able to uh, speak about this good news and it be received so perhaps that's enough and um i'll hand over back to heidi and then perhaps you'll we'll speak again later brilliant thank you very much mark that was that was really lots and lots and lots of food for thought there it's really good um like Mark said, what we're going to do now is um, leading into our Q&A time. Um, what I will do is I'm going to put people into breakout rooms now, but do feel free to go and get yourself, um, you know, a cup of tea or a drink or anything else. And then, but do come back to your um, breakout rooms. Certainly the last couple of weeks, there's been some great discussions that have happened during those. Um, and then we will all come back together. How, how long do you think, Mark? About 15 minutes? Yeah, or you're muted. 15? I'm going to go with 15 because um, I think that's what we've ended up with the last couple of weeks. Um, so about 15 minutes and then we'll all come back together at the end for a bit of uh, Q&A time. Yeah, and sorry, 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. No worries. Okay, so we're all back together again. And uh, when I popped into the breakout rooms um, a few minutes ago, there were some very interesting and very in-depth conversations going on. So has anybody got any comments or any questions to ask Mark? Now, obviously there's quite a few of us here. So perhaps the thing to do is to either physically raise your hand or you can um, raise your Zoom hand if you know how to do that or I, can, I think I'm pretty sure I can see all of you on my screen. Um, or you can uh, just type a message in the chat. Is there anybody who'd like to go first? Malithi got a hand up, I think. No, I was just showing off, no, it's just showing off that I knew what to do. As I've been given the floor, I'd just like to say, Mark, that was, really very helpful for me because I often think that I'm such a rubbish person at doing mission mm. but um, that's really helpful and I'm feeling very much better so thank you but I have no questions at the moment okay thank you uh, fabulous Leithy thank you uh, Chloe you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, Chloe, I think you yeah. did. Thank you, I know. Um, I was just taking a minute. Yeah, this question that came up in our group, which Heidi said is kind of quite a universal question, is how do you, um, you're talking about being kind of behaving well and being like salt and light and people just knowing by our actions, you know, that there's something different about us, but how do you then broach the subject of, of faith and your beliefs if it doesn't come up? Um, for example, if you've got neighbours you get on well with, but you never quite get beyond just kind of, um, I guess, the pleasantries or talking about what you're doing. 
um, and they never kind of ask you why you're doing what you're doing. Mm, that's a good question. I think I think in this day it's best to almost wait for them to ask or you know even it's so you're going to church I suppose but something like that and then you've got something to respond to uh, because we're so aware we don't want to be ramming things down people's throats but when you've got a good relationship with somebody um, I think you can you know there's no reason why you can't invite them to something which you think is going to be good please come with me to this um, I think you know or something like that I think it depends on how strong your relationship is um, but it seems to me that if your relationship's good you can treat them like friends you want to talk straight with them uh, and, and it's not something we should be embarrassed about particularly if we think well this is something great that I've found and I'm only trying to share it I'm not I, you know it's not that I've somehow earned it and I know something more than you it's just this is good news this is life-saving stuff so a lot of it is how you go about it and I'm sure Chloe you do it in a winning way but I think this day and age I think generally you're, you're hoping that people I would be praying that people might make a response I think that's what praying for contacts we have that pray for five in between Ascension and Pentecost, so pray for the people you have to do with, maybe family and friends. Pray that their hearts will be open, their ears will be open, that they'll have questioning minds. Mm. And and if they make the first step, then yeah. will I be brave enough to try and answer? Mm. Brilliant. Uh, Michael and Miffy. Yes, uh, I'd like to come at it from the other end, if I may. Um, our experience over the last three or four years uh, here with people walking past, losing their way, etc., is engage them in conversation. And I take your points about um, how do you break through? Mm. Um, and we found uh, that if the conversation is going somewhere, um, and you're really engaging with the person, um, you offer them a cup of tea and a piece of cake. Um, and, and then you see where it goes from there. And then before they, and, and before they go, you then say, we always offer uh, people a little present before they go. We ask them if they would like a blessing. And then when you do that, that can open up a whole other conversation. Very good. And of course, being so near the River Dart, you could then baptise them. <laughs> well, actually, um, is Jane here somewhere? No, I'm only Jane. Yeah, there yes, she is. there's Jane. Yeah. In fact, we did talk to Jane <laughs> about the possibility of doing a baptism down at our beach. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but actually, I love that idea about blessing them because people, and if you do ask to pray for people, sometimes, although they might be initially not sure, but if you're going to say the prayer, not make them pray, usually they're very, very grateful. Yeah, thing, as long as it doesn't go on for half an hour. No, no, exactly. The thing, the thing that we've noticed is that if you say to somebody, um, Can I pray for you? they immediately assume that there's something wrong with them right. and that we've, we've identified something that needs fixing. Yeah. Whereas if you offer them a blessing, that's a gift mm. and they don't, they can accept it without yeah. having to think about anything other than, Oh, this is a gift. Yeah. Lovely. Um, and we've only had, I think two or three people mm. who've said no. It's interesting, isn't it? Sometimes just those little, you know, the words we choose to describe yeah. something, just a very minor difference in, you know, in definition, but actually they can make a really big difference. Mm. Yeah. Very helpful. It's, it's really interesting where you've said that, because a prayer does seem um, something that, as you say, they can be hesitant about, whereas a blessing, it's beautifully, your choice is beautiful. Mm. Yeah, and, and I think uh, both Mike and Miffy and well and yourself, Catherine, have pressed all the right buttons with Mark, because if you offer free food and drink, he's just there. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> I think Sharon's got a question, Tony. Sorry. Go on, yeah. Sharon. That's not a question, actually. It's going on from what Miffy's just said. Because I'm actually a hospital chaplain in Dawlish Hospital when we haven't got COVID. And it's very, very interesting because if I ask people when I'm actually talking to them and stood next to their bed, would they like a prayer? No, they're not interested. Mm. Even people that tell me that they don't believe at all. Mm. But I've often said, well, can I give you a blessing before I leave you? Brilliant. Or would you? Completely different. And yeah. they accept that willingly because it's a gift from me to them. And it really does work. It really mm -hmm. has done over mm -hmm. the years that I've been doing it. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. We've got a couple Thank of you. questions in the chat, Mark, as well. Um, Donna says, um, actually, we might do Donna's one second. Um, Chloe's commented, how do we do good hospitality in these times? Presumably meaning when we're not allowed to give people tea and coffee and things like that. Oh, no, yes. <laughs> it's a big question, that one, isn't it? And we've talked about it a lot, I think. Um, I do. Norma? What I find doing is baking and giving it to people. Mm. Well, that's a nice idea, yeah. If I've sort of made scones or something, I people are near me, I've given them the scones or, like, um, cake or something. Mm. Just to... A, because I enjoy baking and I'm by myself. And where normally I would invite somebody in, I can't do that. But if I'm careful and I'm baking, I can actually give it to somebody as a gift to help them know that they're remembered. Lovely. Thank you, Norma. That is lovely, yeah. Yeah. So Donna's um, question, which might be something not just perhaps specifically for Mark, but for other people to kind of chip in on as well is um, what do you think is most attractive about Jesus for these days and what is least attractive about Jesus for these days? It's quite a big question, that one, I think, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Um, I suspect there's probably also no one right answer because, um, to my mind, it probably depends an awful lot on... Um, somebody's situation and, and the context that they're living in and through. I think actually, if I just throw one lo uh, rock in the pool, maybe start people thinking, I think Donna actually touched on this in her lecture uh, five, six weeks ago about Jesus in the wilderness. I mean, he, you know, he was sent out by the spirit into the wilderness. It was God's plan. He went out in the wilderness, but he's, he's had times in the wilderness. He knows what it's like on his own, at the end of his tether um so from that point of view that for me is attractive we have a savior who knows exactly what we're going through perhaps more so mm. um so that that's helpful i think tempted in all points as we are mm. yeah we, don't. we have we uh this is stan, by the way speaking so, sorry go on stan uh the group Heidi put us with again. We were three of us was together uh, two weeks ago. Three, well, three weeks now, isn't it? Before the holiday, uh, and we 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 had a, a similar discussion of what you mentioned of uh, the last of the three: behave, belong, and believe. Mm. And in agreement that uh, Sharon testified a, a few weeks ago of that. Uh, the attraction of Jesus that people should see and be able to ask for us to give the response. For them, what you were saying is, if they see the behaviour, it, it will cause them to ask questions. If they see, and my references to the day of Pentecost, of what Peter said towards the end of his preaching. And he said this, uh, that Jesus had uh, been exalted and received of the Father, sent the promise of the Holy Spirit. And this is what you now see and hear. Mm. You see it before you hear it. Mm. And Jesus said, I do what my fa father does. What I see him do, I do. And then he said, what he says, I say. 
So it's in the same pattern that we've been discussing that uh, for evangelism, because we're all at an older end who was gathered together tonight of what happened in our earlier days when we used to evangelize. So there's quite a big gap of what happens from then and, and today. Yeah. Lovely. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Um, Chloe, Chloe, have you still got your hand up? I just had it. It was an answer to Donna's question, actually. Something I, I was going to say, if that's all right, which is about what's most attractive at the moment. I think it's um, the fact that Jesus was um, wanting to hang out with the people who didn't have it all sorted, who were kind of the broken or the struggling or the sort of those on the edge. And at the moment, I guess a lot of, you know, people are in that situation because we're all in a world where we we have to navigate each day a new, you know, we, everything's different. We kind of don't know quite what's happening, etc. So I find that quite um, comforting. Um, and what's least attractive, as I mean, nothing's really unattractive, but the fact that so much of his ministry was around hospitality and being in groups and traveling and being, you know, in various places with crowds. And right now, none of that is kind of possible. So I'm quite interested in like what Jesus would have been doing in lockdown, you know, how he would have been still meeting with his disciples, you know, what would he have been on Zoom or would he have been hanging out in the queue at the co-op or, you know, outside a hospital? It's, it's just quite interesting wondering what, you know, where he, where he would be right now if he was here, which I know he is, but you know what I mean? So. He's probably gone to Barnard Castle, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think one of the most attractive things is that sense of responsibility, that sense of that, that Jesus, it sounds ridiculous to say he did the right thing, but he, he was his own person. Mm. And I think at the moment we are living in a world very much of celebrity, or, um, a competitive world that, that somebody being their own person is he is a very attractive example of that mm. and I sometimes think we lose it a bit because we make him too passive sometimes when we say God sent his only begotten son that it because it's the trinity of God and the spirit and, and Christ that I sort of I don't like the phrase God sent because I can imagine God and Jesus looking at each other and Jesus saying, okay, we know what will happen, but I'll try it anyway. Um, of being the attractiveness is he isn't he isn't being being assessed. And I think fortunately we've got to an age group or I've got to an age group where being assessed is not incredibly important, but but I think a younger age group, there's so many assessments going on. Mm. So it's very attractive that we are looking at somebody who was their own, their own person. Mm. Thank you. I certainly think about his authenticity, there's something about his authority, he had authority, it comes up a lot in the scriptures. He was seen as a person who walked the walk and, you know, that, therefore he had a natural authority he he was god through and through is human through and through I, don't, I can't really explain it but he had something that people what trusted him and i think there's something about that if we can try and be true to ourselves and um yeah i i think not try and be what we're not you know and i certainly think when it comes to evangelism you don't want to be forcing anything um but on the other hand, you sometimes feel scared when um, there is something to do with faith sharing going on. Has anybody else got any questions? Miffy. Just a, just a comment really on, on um, one of the, I think, I don't think it is an unattractive thing, but I think it's perceived as being unattractive. And as I think that a lot of people assume that if they get involved with Jesus, they're going to have to change. And of course they're right. But I think they think they're going to be forced to change all at once. Yeah. And I don't think that they realize that it is a gradual process yeah. and that it's something that 
Yeah. Rather like growing up. Thank you. Yeah. Donna, were you going to say something? I saw your hand up. No, I wasn't actually. I oh. think that's just how she's sitting, Mark. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Shall we um should we draw things to a close then? That's brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Um that was really very thought provoking and that was fairly evident like I say when I went around the uh, breakout rooms just sort of eavesdropping some of the conversations that were going on it was there uh, and I suspect that there's probably quite a few conversations that have been started that are going to be had across the community over the over the next few weeks as well um, so this is actually our last session this week of uh, these lectures um, I, I don't know we might do some more perhaps in the future I, yeah. I personally, I've really I enjoyed all of them. One, I've got a lot out. Heidi, can I just say one thing? To the, yeah. We're thinking we may, if you think this is a good thing, we'd like to get your feedback. I won't, we weren't sending a form out, but if you'd sent something back to say whether you found them helpful, whether if we did something in the spring, sometime between January and April, on this sort of way, um, would you be interested? I think just a, a steer so we know where we're going, because it's quite yeah. difficult to... To know but that would be really helpful sorry Heidi thank you that's okay that's fine so I think as we finish then um Donna would you like to say a closing prayer for us this evening yeah with, with pleasure let's pray Lord we thank you for your presence with us this evening and how your spirit has held us together across this space we thank you for how distance is no impediment to you. Lord, we thank you for the word that you prepared for your servant and son, Mark, to teach this evening. And we give you thanks for the ways in which that has already begun to take root in our hearts. And Lord, we thank you for the reminder that the mission is yours. And that we are called not to be afraid, nor to be anxious, but simply to enjoy living for you and anchored in you to live lives that naturally bear fruit and show who you are to the world. So we pray, equip us again by your spirit for that lively and peace-filled mission so that we may be evangelists to this generation that so desperately needs to hear of you. Help us, Lord, to tell others about where to find water in this desert. Lord, in your mercy. In our prayer. Amen. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Donna. Well, thank you very much for coming, everybody. And uh, hopefully we'll see each other again soon. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Yeah, thank you all. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Heidi. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye, -bye. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>